Welcome, welcome to our Facebook live broadcast. You are speaking to Baring Mujatahu. Now, today is a very important week. It's the start of our National World's Week. It's very important that everybody understands the importance of having a well. Now, if you have got any questions in between, feel free to leave any comments during um, our live broadcast. Feel free to leave any comments and we'll try to answer most of your questions. If needs be, if it happens that maybe for whatever reason we can't come to your question, please still leave it. Just leave your details and we'll make sure your questions are answered. Now, it is very important, as we indicated, is National World's Week. Why should you have a world? What's the importance thereof? Now, I'm going to try and make this as simple as possible. I'm also going to try and make use very clear English or language so that everybody understands what I'm saying. Good. Let's go into the issues then. What's the importance of having a world? Now, for you to understand the importance of having a world, you need to understand what a world is. What is it all about? How can you have a valid one? And then, what are the consequences of not having a will? Good, let's start to understand what a will is. Now, a will is a document. People would say um, um, it's a legal document. But I would say it's just a document. Anything that you have put in writing, anything that you have put on paper, because the one of the requirements for a will is that it must be in writing. Now, who can have a will? Who can make this will? Yes, it has to be in writing, but who can make it? As long as you are from the age of 16 upwards, you can make a will. And it's also very important to understand that you are making a will. So that also means you need to understand what you are making. You need to be sound mind, you know, you need to understand fully that, okay, now I'm making a will. There must not be any duress, there must not be any force, you should not be influenced in any way. Because remember, this is your will. Okay, good. So now we've explained what a will is. Now, a will is any document where you put in guidance or guideline as to what should happen to your assets, to your property, if you're not there anymore. Now, legally, you've got freedom to make, uh, they call it freedom of testa testation. You've got freedom to make a will, meaning you've got freedom to indicate, to give guidance as to what should happen to your will in your way. Nobody can force you to do that. Now, what does that mean it's essentially? It simply means I can make a will and say, no, look, I want uh, Jane to have my car. Now, remember, I might be married, but because I've got the freedom to say what I want, I can say, no, Jane, you should have my car. What does that mean? It simply means I can exclude my wife I can exclude my children. I can give it even to charity. I can say, hey, when I'm not here anymore, I want all my assets, all my money to be given to a certain charity somewhere. Or you can just say, no, I want that person there at the corner to have everything. Now, that's what we mean by you've got freedom to state whatever you want to state in that world. Now, it also means as much as you've got this freedom, you also need to make sure that you do not give any um, conditions which are not uh, valid or which are illegal. You cannot give illegal conditions. But yes, at a certain level, you've got freedom to bring in any conditions or state what people should do when you are not there. 
as long as remember we've got the constitution which, which will obviously check and make sure that all the conditions are fair and constitutional good so now you guys now understand yet you've got freedom to make a will you've got freedom to let get your property be to be distributed or given to whoever as per your wish let's go into the the validity of having a will what do you need to have this will now a will then it must be very clear the property must be described very clearly must be defined very clearly you must be able to say i want house at stand number 234 to be given to jane jane with id number 123 why is that important remember when you are not there anymore we won't know what you want now we don't want any fights we want uh, everything that you have put in there to be very clear it should be daylight it should be very clear to say okay car with registration abc should go to jane with id number one two three that's very clear it doesn't need any interpretation now once you have mentioned uh, once you have that uh, idea you should also have an idea to say who will then take care or be in charge of this will because now meaning you now need to appoint an executor somebody will make sure hey they collect all the property uh, which are in favor of this estate and they will make sure that whatever you have mentioned there if maybe you have mentioned that i should get 10 rand you have made it sure that executor will make sure i will get that 10 rand now once all has been drafted there must be signatures the act is very clear you as the testator the person who makes this will must sign at each and every page if it happens that your will has got more than one page and it must be done in the presence of two witnesses remember i said earlier you just need to be 16 years old but now in this case your witnesses they need to be 14 and above now once you have got your witnesses you yourself have signed because everything has to be done in uh, uh, within uh, uh, each other's presence so once that is done your will is valid remember it's clear uh, uh, definition of your property clear definition as to who should do the beneficiary uh, you have described the beneficiary very well so it becomes very clear as to well, who needs to get what and once everybody has signed where they need to sign it's a valid will now some of our parents or it can happen that you might not be able to sign it does not mean it's the end it simply means you need to make sure there's a commissioner a commissioner to a uh, commission to say no yes i saw the testator making that mark you know sometimes our parents will sign maybe with an x mark or would even have a fingerprint so it's important to have an uh, 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 the commissioner to commission to say i yeah, know indeed i've seen this I've seen the testator or the person who made this will. I've seen this person making that mark or putting the fingerprint. Now, once all that is done, remember, you will then have a valid will. You can then take this will, either take it to maybe, uh, um, uh, in most cases, you have to take it to the masters of the high court in order to execute that. Anyway, we are not there. We are here still on the issue of explaining why you should have a will. So now I'm hoping you understand, after having a valid will, you having the powers to do as you wish or to distribute or give guidance as to what should happen to, the prop to your property, it means you've got all those powers to do that. Now let's go further. This is now the problematic part. If you do not have a will, what's going to happen to your estate? What's going to happen to your property? Then it means you are now allowing the law oh, to take its course. This is now what we call interstate succession. You do not have a will. What's going to happen to your property? Okay. I'm going to try and make it simple and 
and I'm going to go a bit slower so that you can fully understand what it ha what happens. Now the act allows certain scenarios, so I'm going to try and go through those scenarios uh, so that you can understand. Why is this important? Because it will now explain to you if you do not have a will, what will happen to your estate. Okay, according to the act, here's the scenario number one. If you do not have a will, what will happen to your estate? And there's only your wife left. It means your wife will then inherit your whole estate. Good. Now, if another scenario, if it's only your children, it means only your children will inherit. Meaning it's only your children, there's no spouse. Only your children will inherit. Now, the next scenario, this is the one that would be problematic because not everyone would understand. What happens if it's your wife and your children who will inherit? Good, good question. The law states your wife is entitled to have 250,000. And then whatever remains will then be shared amongst the children. Now, this is where we mention child share. What is a child share? Now, a child share simply means before you look at the 250,000, because the wife is entitled to have 250,000 or the child's share, you divide whatever estate you have amongst the, the wife and the children. If that amount, after you have divided it, if that amount is bigger than 250,000, it means the wife will then get that amount. Let me give you an example. Let's say your estate, after everything has been deducted, your estate is one mil, and there's only a wife and a child that remains. What will happen then? It means you will then look at the child share. Child share is this one mil you divided by two, and you will get, it would mean, the wife will get 500,000, and the child will get 500,000. As clear as that. That means there's now the child share. Now, let me make another example. Let's say the estate is quite small. And now, your estate is around 250,000. What will happen then? Now, according to the act, the wife should get 250,000. So that means that 250,000 that's there in your estate, the wife will get everything and then your children will get nothing. Good. Let's move to another scenario. Now, in this scenario, you do not have any, there's no spouse, there's also no children. What will happen then to your estate? Then it means we need to move and check if you've got parents. If your parents are there, both parents, it means they both will share your estate. No issues with that. But if it happens that there's only one parent left and that parent, uh, the other one that, that's deceased, doesn't have any children, it means the one parent will inherit everything. Now, where it becomes a bit complicated is that one parent is alive, the other parent is deceased, but that parent that's deceased has got children. It then means your estate, one parent, will get the 50% that's alive. The one that's deceased, the children of that one that's deceased will then have to share the deceased parents 50%. I'm hoping that's very clear. Now, if it happens, there's no parent, uh, you only, the deceased person only has siblings. It means the siblings now, they will then have a chance to share the estate equally. So that means the deceased brothers and sisters will then be able to share this estate. Okay. In the case where there's no siblings, there's no parents, there's no spouse, there's no children, it then means we now have to look at the nearest blood relation. Meaning that's now where your cousins come in, will now uh, divide it amongst the nearest, and then they will then take it from them. Good. If it then happens, there's no one left, there's no family, there's no blood relation, it then means 
all that, your whole estate, will then be taken to the state. Which means after 30 years, if there's no one that comes forward and says, hey, this person was my uncle or relative, if after 30 years no one comes, it will be absorbed by the state. One last scenario I need to give you. If it happens that uh, you as a t uh, uh, the deceased person, you had a adopted child, the adopted child will be treated as your child. So that means just as in the case of your own child, your estate will be divided as per what I've just explained to you. Now, more or less, that would be in the case where you have not uh, uh, given us any will. Then it means those would be the rules that we would have to follow. I'm hoping in saying what I said, you now understand that the importance of uh, having this will is to make sure you have a say as to what will happen to your estate and nobody would have to now decide on your behalf. You've got a say as to what, your, what should happen to your property and who should get it. So now, I'm hoping I've answered your question. What's the importance of having a will? Maybe just to sum it up, the importance of having that will is to make sure that your estate is divided. Meaning, in the grave, you have a say to say, my estate, I want my estate to be divided in this way, in this fashion. Good. Now, I'm going to open it up for everybody. If you've got any questions, feel free to ask your questions. I'll try to answer as much as I can. Now, it is important to understand that uh, from a legal point of view, as soon as you have uh, satisfied all the, the requirements that I've stated for a valid will, as soon as that is done, when, you, when that document gets to be taken to the masters, based on it, by on the face of it, looking at it, if they see the signatures are there, the signatures of both the person who made this will and the witnesses, they will take it as a valid will. If there are anything, example, maybe whoever disputes that it's your valid will, they would have to prove to say, no man, that was not the true intention of the testator. He didn't want this person to enjoy the property. They will then have to go to the high court and make their case very clear why they think the will is not a true reflection of what the testator wanted. Now, feel free, as I said, feel free to ask you whatever questions you might have. I know I've been talking a whole lot of things and I can still carry on, but I really want to hear from you. Remember, this is the beginning of our World's Week. It's from today, today it's Monday, until Friday. So gather all your family members, your uncles, your grandparents, let them go to our offices and then let them ask for a valid will. Now, what do you need or what would they need when they get to our offices? <coughs> they would need their ID. It's important because in the will, it needs to be, to be made clear who's the person who's making this will. They would need their IDs. Um, it's always important to uh, rather have your ID there so that the person who's drafting it can confirm and see the ID. Bring, if the property you want to be, uh, you're, you're mentioning there, if that property is a house, it's advisable to have the title deed. What's needed is a clear description of the property. Now, it could be a property, it could be a car, it could be anything. It's important that we've got the exact description of that property. Now, the next thing that you would need, because now you would need to appoint an executor, you need to give the clear details of that executor. It could be two executors or it could be one. Now, 
in most cases, you would want an executor, a person that you trust. Some people would choose a pastor. Some would choose maybe a very trusted uncle. Some would even use the bank or whoever, the lawyers. As long as it's somebody that you trust, somebody that you know wouldn't do anything that he's not supposed to do. Then, coming to the beneficiaries, you also then have to have their ID IDs. Look, in most cases, uh, if you do not have their IDs, um, it's not to say it's the end, you can't do anything. It's just for us, the ones who are drafting, to have a clear uh, uh, confirmation that no, these are the people who are supposed to be inheriting. Example, if you come and say, no, I want uh, um, shakes, to have whatever, to have maybe a house, your house. We know there are a lot of sheikhs in this country. You might find some people have first name, second name, and surname the same. So that is why you should always have your ID with you. Once that is done, you should also then clearly define as to what uh, uh, portion they should get, if there's a certain portion. If maybe you want a certain percentage, half of a land, you should make it very clear you want this person to have this. Let me take you back a bit. If it then, as I indicated, though the requirements for having a valid will, what it means, it simply means you yourself can draft your own will. As long as you've got witnesses, you sign in the presence of witness, the will is valid. You don't necessarily have to go, in fact, you don't have to go to the police. Unless, if you're just going to make a mark or a fingerprint, yes, then you would need a commission of oath. But if it's just normal signature, you can draft it your own way. The only problem is that you might not know uh, how to describe the property fully, you might not know certain things which a lawyer would know. Tax implications as to why and how, especially if you want to put in conditions. That's where us lawyers can then guide you and to say, no man, this is how you should do it. Um, you do not need all these fancy words. I'm sure you would have picked up. I've tried to use very clear language. I did not use any legal jargon. I wanted to make sure you fully understand. You don't need to put that in your wall either. You just need clear, simple language. So that's why we advise you then to rather get a lawyer so that a lawyer can draft that wall for you. It's the beginning of our Wells Week. Grab that chance and go to our offices so that our officers then can then, uh, uh, when you get there, you can get a qualified lawyer who can draft it for you and then explain to you. You know, an important thing is that you need a good explanation. You need to fully understand what you put in there. So you need a lawyer then to help you, to describe to you what you have put in there. And so that at least at the end of the day, when you're not there anymore, you've got some, or you know the document is valid and the document is very clear. There won't be any explanation needed. See, I'm even using simpler words. Any explanation. There won't be anything that's complicated. It will be very clear. Okay. I'm saying this. I'm still waiting for you guys to provide us with any questions, if there's any. Okay. I believe there's one question. <coughs> we have a question from Miss Mangaka. She says, tell me about if the marriage happened and then the husband dies and the death certificate says that the husband was single but it's your husband and the family and the children of the deceased are denying this who is then entitled to inherit okay now there's a whole lot of issues that needs to be explained there if it's your husband how do you prove it's your husband that's important part remember some example if you're married in uh, uh, customarily so uh, if you haven't registered the marriage home affairs won't know that you are married 
Now, it becomes difficult because now you have to prove your marriage. You have to prove that indeed you are married to this person. Civil marriage is easy because I believe then they would, you would even have a certificate to confirm and show that you are married to this person. Now, if you are able to prove that you are married, it's not an issue. Because then you've got the, uh, you can even get a marriage certificate. Once that is done, your husband died without a will, but you are married to this husband then you remember that scenario I indicated to you where if you die as the spouse only or if you die as a spouse and children that will now take place interstate succession will take place there's no will so that means all other people remember throughout uh, what I've explained I never mentioned uh, 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 any family members coming into the picture no I haven't why the spouse is there so if it happens there's no will you are able to prove the marriage then he will inherit uh, um, depending on how big the estate is the 250,000 that I've mentioned if it's less than that you will inherit everything if there are no children you will inherit everything I'm hoping I've answered your question but the difficulty in your question or in your scenario then would be how do you prove you are married so if you are able to get through that, then it becomes easier in terms of uh, uh, establishing who is supposed to inherit or not. Now, uh, maybe just to take the conversation a bit further. Say maybe, yes, you are married, customary. Now, the problem with customary, not many people would register it. At that time, when you guys get married, it's a customary marriage, families come together, everybody is happy. Um, families don't have issues with you. Now, if you've got, remember, when you customary marriage, it's all about families coming together and having that proof to say, uh, family, uh, uh, the Tlaminis and the Kumalos met on such and such a date, and on date, on that date, it was agreed that these two people are married. That's customary marriage. Now, they might not have registered it. If you've got that proof, it probably could then assist in proving that you are married without that proof you can further go to maybe the chief in that area you can pro have your uh, um, photos you could have um, the counselor people who were there they could assist in proving that your marriage is valid it then means uh, especially with having to prove you might then have to go to the high court to prove that you are married to this person. Once the court declares that you are married, then the scenarios that I've given earlier will then take place. I'm hoping that's clear. If there's any further questions, please let them come. Ms. Bangaka says thank you very much. Crystal clear. Um, Great stuff. We have two more questions. If if we come to a legal aid to say office during Will's Week and we have a will drafted, what do we do with it? Where do we keep it? Good question. Remember, legal aid, we don't keep wills. Now, and I must say it's a good question because now you has that responsibility to make sure that will, you keep it safe. That is why some people would either take, give it to the bank but some banks, they make you pay for it, keeping it safe. Some lawyers, they make you pay for it. Now, where do you keep it? It's entirely up to you. But make sure you keep it at a very safe place. Just an example, some people might say, might give, show it or give it to their pastor to, to keep it safe. The important thing here is that you must be able to keep it at a safe place there must be somebody who knows about it at least because now it wouldn't help to have a very good will and when you pass on nobody can find it so it must be very clear as to where it is at least one person should know where it is now you also don't want people to know what's in there especially the beneficiaries because they might just speed up the process of you of them having to use that will 
they might just maybe find means to let you kick the bucket quickly. So now, you don't want the beneficiaries to know, but you would want somebody, somebody you trust, to know where it is. Legal aid, we don't keep walls. So once we have drafted it for you and we're happy all the signatures are there, we'll give it back, to, we'll give it to you, and then you will then find ways where to keep it. You can either put it in a, in a maybe case, wherever you put it, uh, as long as you know it's safe. And maybe just on that note, maybe just to add as well, remember a world, once you have drafted it, you can always come back to change. It's not a once-off thing. You can always come back to, to change. Say, no man, in, the, in that first world, I wanted John to have my car. But now I don't want John anymore. You want somebody else to have the car. It's just an example. So you can come and change it. Now, the Act does not give any requirements for date. But should you have more than one world, we will then encourage that you should have a date so that we can then check the last wall. Say maybe we've got more than five walls, we'll always check the last one. So the last one would be your valid wall. Good, uh, the next question. Okay, Debbie has a question. Um, I'm just trying to see it because it is being hidden. Debbie says, if a man and woman were married and divorced after some years and they didn't share, and then the woman married again and the ex died, the first husband died, what then happens to the properties? Okay. Now, we would always encourage you that as soon as the divorce takes place, rather try to sort it out immediately. Yes, the surviving spouse still has a claim as per the marital uh, the, the, the divorce decree. would still have a claim against that estate because they haven't uh, uh, claimed it yet. Now, um, and that's what I'm saying, it becomes very complex because now, uh, remember, in a joint estate, a joint estate can be divided into two. In two occasions, if there's death, or if there's a divorce. So that means the first time, the first one already took place in that there was a divorce. Now, if you look at your decree of divorce, it will show there. Um, either there might be a settlement agreement, but in most cases, the courts would, would write there uh, as a division of joint estate. It simply means division of joint estate, uh, um, each party would have 50-50 of that estate. Now, if it has never been claimed before, should the ex die? Because remember, the ex has got his own estate now. He's got a separate estate. It's no longer a joint estate. But because you never claimed it, it means you as a surviving, surviving spouse, you can then still claim your half estate. And then from there, you would have lost, I mean, there wouldn't be any ties with you anymore. Because that's when the that, when divorce took place, that's when the estate got divided. Good, I'm hoping I've answered your question. But if it's still, you still need some clarity on that, feel free to call our, um, our call center number. You can either ask for myself or whoever that's there, they'll explain to you the exact same thing and make sure that you understand. We have another question from Lebuchang. Good day. If the deceased died with a valid will and he did not include his other children, can the will be contested? Okay, good. That's a good question. Remember when I said, as a testator, you've got a freedom to give your property to whoever you want. Now remember, this is not interstate, meaning there is a will. As a testator, if I die, I can choose who I want to give my property to. So whether I've give, mentioned one child or all of them, 
I can have five children and a spouse, but still in my will, I can still show that I want to give my estate to a charity or I want to give my estate to some person which is unknown to the family. Now, how would you contest it? You can't contest it unless if the time you've got proof that the time when this person made this will, he was not in a sound mind or he could not understand what happened or there was duress. So if there's no such, that means the person can do what you want with this property. Now, there is at least some light for the children who are not mentioned there. It means those children can then approach the, the estate and are a claim for if they need maintenance, they can claim for maintenance. Obviously, they would then have to prove that. They would then have to prove they need maintenance. But if it's children, say maybe they are adults already, they've got their own means, they are working, then you, you might not be able to prove that you need maintenance. You might then not have any, any claim against the estate. It would then mean whatever the testator have mentioned there, it will stay as is. Good, I'm hoping I've answered that. But as I said, whenever, if there's something that's not clear, feel free to call us back. One other question, Bareng. Can the executor also be a beneficiary in the okay. world? Good. Now, the executor, remember, the, world, the, the rules are that you can be a beneficiary as long as you do not sign. Because you don't want to, because it would be like you are influencing who, uh, the testator or, uh, uh, to make this. Yes, the beneficiary can be an executor. Now, the executor, remember an executor, you are stepping in the shoes of the testator. You, I would call it informally, you are the manager of that estate. You are administering the estate. So what does that mean? Your duties is to make sure you collect whatever you need to collect in, in favor of this estate. You pay off whatever that needs to be paid off. Once that is done, then you look and say, okay, now I've done that. What does the world say? As per the world, if I'm the testator and I need, I mean the executor, and I needed to get maybe a car, then you can proceed. You can have the car. Sometimes it might happen, maybe there's not even a will, but you are the only child. And obviously the only child and the only relative there, you might then approach the court to apply to be the executor. And then you'll then, even if it means you are having to give the property to yourself, it's your duties as the, ex uh, the executor. The masters of the High Court wouldn't have any issues with that. So yes, it is possible for the executor to then inherit. And then, looks like one last question. What, what do I do if, if I'm married and my husband passes away? Where do I start with this whole process of having the estate be managed by the master's office. Okay. Now, that's not part of, it forms part of administration of the estate. Where do you start? Now, whether you've got a will or not, the first step is for you to be, be appointed as the executor. So where do you start? Depending on how big the estate is. If the estate is, say, uh, less than 250000 you go to the magistrate's court. If it's more than that, you have to go to the Masters of the High Court. You then apply to be the executor of that estate. So that means, uh, maybe even more practical, uh, husband has died today. You get a death certificate. Now at Home Affairs, they will probably stamp that uh, ID of the husband to show he's no more. You then take those documents. You go to the masters of the high court. They will then give you some more documents for you to fill in. But they will need the death certificate. They will need the ID. They will need some other forms like uh, you identifying the body. They will need all that information. You fill in those forms. They will then assist you 
to be the executor. So once you have been appointed as executor, now the masters, because they are, I would call them the mother body, they have to make sure that everything gets to be distributed according to the law and fairly. So once they've appointed you as the executor, they'll keep on checking to make sure you've, you are doing the right thing. Now, as I said, it's just unfortunate. This part is more administration. It's, it's um, administration of the estate. So now, there's a whole lot of other things that needs to happen. But for the purpose of this conversation, I'm hoping you would understand like the first step where you need to do, where, where you need to go. So obviously, once you have the letter of executorship, you will then, I mean, you will now have the power, isn't it? You are stepping in the shoes of the, of the, the late. You'll then have the powers to go to the bank, and retrieve the money. You'll have the powers to collect all properties. It is your duty to open a, le uh, um, a late estate account with any banks. And then from the owners, the masters of the record will also guide you as to what you need to do. Look, I don't want, uh, um, I don't want us to go deep into that. <laughs> Because as I've already mentioned, it's part of administration of the, admi uh, of the estate. But at least I'm hoping I've given you an idea. So the first step, if that happens, you take whatever documents that I've mentioned, you go to the masters of the high court, they will guide you further as to what you need to do. Good. If there are no any further questions, please remember, uh, you can always call our um, uh, call center we've got a legal aid advice line it's a toll free number you can call us on 0 8 let me repeat 0 8 now we operate monday to friday now monday to Thursday, we operate from 7 a.m. until 5 a.m. No, on Friday, the knocking off times are but different. In that, instead of knocking off at 5, we would be knocking off uh, uh, 45 minutes earlier. So it wouldn't be uh, 5 o'clock, it would be quarter, quarter past 4, we'll be closing. So, but anyway, between the times that I've given you, you call us between those times. You can either ask for myself or whoever, as per your language preference, will be, able, will be there to assist you. Remember, you are very important to us. We'll always make sure we give you the best service ever. Should it happen that you are not able to call us, you can call our call or you can send us a please call. Remember, it's not even a message. You just send us a please call. And then we will come back to you. We will most definitely call you back. Our um, um, please call me number. It's 079-835-7179. We will then most definitely assist you. If you wish to visit our um, online, you can go to www.legalaid.co.za. You can also go there if you want to download a free basic will. Remember, for us, we make sure that we provide you with a free basic will. If there's any issues, we'll be, you can always discuss and ask whatever questions you need. I'm hoping you guys will make use of this time for you guys to get your own valid will. Be sure that you make use of this chance. Now, we will have a second, will, uh, a second session on Thursday where we will be discussing marriage regimes and, will, and wills, contesting a will, children and the wills. So meaning, this is not the end of it. You will have another chance. Please make, make use of those chances. We have three more questions. Oh, just popped in. okay. <laughs> I hear there's three more questions just before we leave. Yes, Ms. Vangaka, who asked a question earlier. Okay. How long does the executor 
work for a client regarding the estate? Now, remember, the executor is not a, a matter of executor and a client. An executor, legally, as per the administration of wills, an executor would have around six months. And if after six months it's not done, then the executor needs to apply to the masters to give them some more time, which would normally be another three months. So in, in a way, you could say nine months. Now, I need to explain that part of client. Now, what normally happens is that because you are not a, a, a legal person, you are not a lawyer, so now you as the executor, you will approach a lawyer and say, hey, lawyer, please assist in winding up this estate of the late person. Now we call it, wind, it's a winding up process. Now the lawyer will then act as your agent. You understand? You are still the executor, but the lawyer acts as your agent. Yes, the lawyer will do the runarounds, the lawyer will then advertise the estate, the lawyer will assist you in drawing up the liquid and distribution account. It's important that you understand this. So once that is done, the lawyer will then submit it with the masters of the high court. If the masters of the high court are, is happy with it, they will give a thumbs up. But as long as you understand, you've got six months, you can apply for another three months, then it means in total it's nine months. Good. I'm hoping I've answered your question. Yes. Okay. Let me get to the other. Sorry, buddy. It's just jumping a bit. No problem. Cindy asks, how do you enforce a bank that is holding the funds of the deceased to transfer the funds to the estate late account? Okay, look, um, obviously there would be reasons as to why the bank would either delay and why uh, they might not pay the money in, into this account. Um, under normal circumstances, you can always go to the courts if you want to enforce it. But remember, like any other problem, before you can even run to the courts, first understand clearly what is the problem. Identify the problem. Because I do not think that, you remember, the banks, they do not have powers to be withholding. If you have provided them with the necessary documents or whatever information they need, they will have to release or they will then have to pay. So now, I would rather suggest you go, go into the details, find out as to what is the exact problem. Now, like any legal matter, you don't just go to the courts uh, uh, just when there's a, 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 uh, maybe people don't act the way you want. Because now the courts would also want to know, why is this matter here? Why are you bringing this case to us? So. If you then explain to the bank, no, the, the, bank, the bank is not providing the money, it's not going to help you. Because the bank obviously would provide with reasons. So the, import, the, f the important part is, the first place is to start finding out why. Once you understand the issues, yes, then you approach the lawyer and say, hey, these people are not paying, what can I do? <laughs> Sometimes you might also find, by just a mere le letter, the, the banks might respond. So yes, ultimately, if there's no assistance, you go to the High Court to assist you. Excellent. And then, Josiel asks, can a living will nullify the legal consequences of a marriage in community of property? Now, the question is, what is a, what's a living will? Now, the other thing is, everything, there's a constitution to make sure we, uh, they always check the balances. Now, a living will, it's merely to indicate as to what should be happening to you. So, um, 
as indicated earlier, you've got freedom to make your statement or to st state what should happen when you're not there. So now, that freedom counts there as well. So in a way, I wouldn't say nullify, but it simply means you've got a better say, you've got a bigger voice when you have that will, when you've made that living will, you've got a better say. It means the courts, if there's any disputes, the courts will look at what were, were the intentions of the testator, and then they will then be able to enforce that. So yeah, maybe in a way, if you say nel I wouldn't know you want to use the word nullify, but it simply means the, um, the wishes of the testator will take preference. Okay. No. Otherwise, thank you so much for sharing this moment with me. I'm hoping you guys will then have an idea as to why it's important to have a will. Visit our offices. Call us as per the information that I've already given you, and then you take it from there. Please make use of this chance, because I know sometimes you might not have this anymore. Make use of it. You've got from today until Friday. Make use of that chance. Otherwise, good luck. Thank you so much for sharing this moment with me. Good. Bye for now.